John Cole with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Easily. Can you imagine life without competitiveness? People say there's two kinds of people. Some people say the glass is half empty. Some people say the glass is half full. I think they're both losers. Who wants to live with a half full glass? You know, we were about, let's fill this thing up. If you're gonna do something, fill it up and, uh, and, and go for it. Competitiveness, I think that's a gift. And just like there's a lot of things that are gifts, but competitiveness is a gift. And as long as you have that, I think you don't have to grow up. You can grow older, but you don't have to grow up. Best part about being a lineman is uh, it is the most learned position. Nobody teaches Franco how to carry a football. And probably Lin Swan, I know he did his ballet thing, but uh, uh, most of the stuff they do is natural. It is not natural for what linemen do, which is going into things. And uh, most people want to, you know, intuitively want to dodge something. But linemen are supposed to go run into stuff. And, uh, and so it's not just go do it, it's how you do it. And uh, Dan Radakovich, I think probably the best, uh, Raleigh Dodge, the best two offensive line coaches that ever lived. Uh, they were all about technique. To win four in six years, it has to be about something besides a win. It has to be about something about guys coming together for a purpose. There was a, uh, a process, and I would, I would put that in Chuck's lap. He really understood the process that Chuck know that it took to, to go to a Super Bowl and to win a Super Bowl. And the goal is the relationship. Uh, we had a lot of guys that had different personalities, but there was still a huge um, tightness, uh, I think, on this team. And uh, not that we didn't get in fights. I remember there was a fight because George Perlis would get us stirred up. He would get the offensive line stirred up, and there was, I mean, uh, but there was still a relationship there, and, uh, and that's what it was about. Jack Lambert was giving me a really hard time in practice, and they were getting under my skin. And uh, Dwight and Jack particularly, like, and John Banzak, completely, they loved to do that. And so I finally said to Jack, all right, then you, you come on, bring it. And he ran over me. I, I thought he would have run up the field. He ran over me. And then, this is in practice, and just clobbered Terry. And so Terry's laying on the ground, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, Jack's in trouble. And no, Chuck came over and he's, he's hollering at me for 15 minutes, you know, because it didn't matter if it's in a game or in practice, you did your job and everything was full speed. It was always competitive. And I think that or we learned that everything you do, you get out of bed and from then on, you know, the motor doesn't idle. Hey, welcome John Cole, would you? Thank you, John. God Thank bless you, man. Love you, buddy. Thank you. Thank here you go. Have a seat. We'll put this over here for you. Oh, no, we'll start with that. Oh, we're going to start with that. Okay. Well, look. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -oh. I always like to keep things straightened out. And Stephanie told me you wear this 58 jersey. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, like as I said, I, I kind of, I'm a throwback. Well, we have to get that straightened out. Oh. Oh, nice. Oh, awesome. So today we have fantasy football. This is collision football. So <laughs> Thank you so you much. This you. is awesome. What a deal. And one other thing, I know you're not a, particularly a ring guy, and uh, most of the guys that... Uh, that have some of these, don't wear them that often, but we were able to get a replica of the third Super Bowl, which, by the way, happens to be my favorite, and I thought you might. Oh, my goodness. Whoa, thank you. Oh, how cool. Now we can get started. I'll tell you what, I'd ask you to come just for this stuff, just to be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know. You know, really, it just no, this this looks about the size that you guys would wear too, because you could put two <laughs> fingers in them. But you know, Ernie we, Holmes wore size twenty-one. <laughs> that's like that's 21. my ankle. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you had thirteen years in the NFL, 
uh, you had 10 years of a coach, as a coach. You're 70 now, which you don't look 70. And I put on my Facebook feed that uh, the windmill, is that what you call it, the exercise? Windshield you, wiper. The windshield wiper. Yes. You go on my Facebook page and you have to watch it. I, I was going to do it tonight, but just for time's sake, you've got to watch him do this thing. It is freakish. No human being at any age uh, should be able to pull that exercise off, and uh, it's crazy. And, uh, and, and at your age, at any age to do that is not, a, is not really human. So you guys just have to take a look at that. But, but you know, uh, the, the first time I heard you speak uh, was at a men's event, and I heard you tell the story about when you, you tried to kill Bradshaw, and uh, maybe not on purpose, but you've got to tell us that story, and, uh, and then we'll get into the meat of what you're doing uh, right now with your life. And, and so we got you messed up on the microphone, didn't right. we? Right. You know what? Let me see if I can help. I think yeah, I this... killed the microphone as well. Yeah, let me see. Here we go. Let me get you. There you are. You should be good. Right about like that. You good? Good. All are right. good? Awesome. I think one of the things that I, I don't know if you all could even hear that. I couldn't hear it. Uh, but uh, and I was talking on the screen about it was amazing in the 13 years I was in Pittsburgh, I never was aware of, a, of any friction. It was amazing how people got together. But nevertheless, we had different factions. And there was the LC, Dwight White, with their clothing fac faction. I saw a picture today of Dwight White. He had green pants with white polka dots on in his picture. <laughs> And then there was the Andy Russell and Jack Ham and uh, Rocky Blyer. They were the investment guys. You know, they would sit around on Saturdays and talk about investments. But then there were the Rednecks. And probably the president of the Redneck Club was Jack, Jack Lambert. Uh, Jerry Mullins may have been vice president. Terry always wanted to get into that club, but he didn't know the terminologies. You know, he didn't, he didn't speak redneck well enough. And so we happened to be playing Cleveland. And as you know, Cleveland doesn't really show up in Pittsburgh. So nobody was taking the game that serious on Saturday. And we were just sitting around in our little factions. And Terry was sitting there. And if you see him on TV, he was doing just like he does on TV. He was trying to get in the conversation, but he just didn't know the the terms, and Jack Lambert was talking about the muzzle velocity of a 243, is what he was talking about. And Terry, you know, he doesn't know really the muzzle velocity of football, but he can throw one. <laughs> and so that night, we were roommates, and that night, he's asking me what Jack was talking about, and I was trying to break it down for him. And, uh, and then he said, you know, I've never shot a deer. And I thought, in Pennsylvania, you've never shot a deer. You can run over them. You know, there's so many. <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, you know, I, I lived on a farm, and I fed the cattle in the morning, and uh, they would leave, and then the, the deer would come out and kind of clean up what's left. So I said, I'll tie one up for you. And then that way you can come out. And uh, so he was going to come out that morning, but after the game, and, and it turned out the way we wanted, uh, it wasn't really a game. And he, he was single, and Jerry Mullins was single, so they ended up having a date or something. So they didn't come out till the next morning. I'd already fed. And so they, I said, well, go up on the hill on your own. And uh, they went up there. The hunters they were, they were gone five minutes. <laughs> and I went to take a shower. I didn't even have time to take a shower, and I hear this noise in the barn, and Terry is trying to saddle a horse, and it was a roping horse. And... If you ever saddle a horse, you have a roping horse, you have a cinch in the front. That goes tight. The girth in the back is supposed to be loose. He had it backwards. And if it's backwards, she'll buck, or he will buck. And so this horse was just bucking, and I thought, I better go out there because I didn't want the horse to get hurt, but I didn't want him to get hurt either. So I saddled the horse, and then I got on her, and he said, I told him it was a roping horse. And he said, well, show me. So I got back and I rode real fast right at her, and at about five yards, we did a slide stop right in front of him. And he's like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. We'll rope something. Well, I didn't have time to go get any calves or anything, so I said, okay, this was my second mistake, <laughs> letting him saddle the horse. I said, okay, go across the road and take off running.
I don't even have to fabric. This is the way it happened. So we went across the road, and then he began to challenge me. He's running. If you see, you can't, you can't get, you know, he's looking up. You can't catch me. The horse has four legs. What's he thinking? <laughs> so I spurred her and got right up on him, rope, a couple, rope the, roped him, dallied the rope, and he's standing there roped. <laughs> but now I've got to get the rope off. And she's trained to back up. He keeps walking up to her, and she keeps backing up. So the next mistake, number three I made, is I got off the horse, and I'm walking to him, and all of a sudden he goes, what will happen if she spooks? <laughs> well, that spooked her, and off they go <laughs> out into the pasture. And if you've ever seen the Three Rivers Regatta, you know, you've got those speedboats, and that spray goes off. Okay. There was dew on the grass, and all I could see was this spray, <laughs> Go and they're going down the pasture, and he's kind of bouncing like that. <laughs> but I knew he was alive because he's going, ah, help, ah, help. I never heard a snap count like that. It was always hit one, but it's, ah, help, ah, help. And so, there's a barbed wire fence at the end of the, and I'm going, oh Lord, please save him from that. And it's ama I hate to say this, but I was thinking, will this be manslaughter? <laughs> <laughs> because there's no way he's coming back alive. She, she, did, she turned around and headed back around the backside of the pasture, and he's still going, help at that time. Now she starts the second lap, and I thought, well, maybe if I at least try to save him, then they won't put me in jail for the rest of my life. <laughs> and so she comes running by, and my plan was to grab the saddle, jump on like John Wayne did, but it didn't work. And so I, I grabbed the rope, and now she's dragging both of us. <laughs> so that was like my fifth mistake. And I'm on my left shoulder, and within about 20 yards, my shoulder was killing me. I can't imagine what he was feeling like. And so the problem, though, was her feet are right there by my head. And I thought, if I hold on, I'm going to get kicked in the head. If I let loose, I'm going to crash into him and kill him. So I'm, you know, and now, by the way, he wasn't going, ah. he was just, it looked like <laughs> Turkey Jones in the Cleveland game. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, the thing that saved us is he had put the wrong reins on. Roping reins are one rein. He'd put split reins on, and I looked up, and there was, a, there was a rein dragging on the ground, and I reached up and grabbed it, and then let loose the rope. That turned her head around, and she stops and starts eating grass. <laughs> and so I'm laying there, and I'm looking, and he's not moving. I'm thinking he's dead. And Jerry Mullins, to show you how linemen love each other, <laughs> He'd been, he'd been sitting on the fence laughing because he did not realize how serious this was. And he comes, I, I'm not, I, I don't, he comes walking out there. He steps over Brad, doesn't even check him, and he comes up to me and says, Colby, are you all right? <laughs> and Brad heard that. He couldn't talk too loud because the rope was so tight. So, but he goes, he goes, Moon, I'll kill you. <laughs> And I was, it was Resurrection Sunday. I said, he's alive. <laughs> he's alive. And we got up there, and, and we got him stood up, and the only thing wrong was he had a bunch of rope burns around his uh, waist. He threw four touchdowns the next Sunday. So well, That's uh, all right. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, just, I, just had, I just had to have you uh, uh, tell that story. That is the truth. Now, he wrote a book. Did he put that in there? Yes, Did he? but oh. he tells it a little bit different. My version is right. <laughs> <laughs> he says in his book, I spooked the horse. No, I told you. This is, this is Saturday night service. I, I told it the way it was. That's the way it happened. <laughs> well, he, you could see where he might forget maybe yeah. from br brain damage from the, uh, <laughs> the ride. But, you know, uh, John, in the world we live, Christians very often think of doing something for God in the context of a church or not of all sometimes. And what I've uh, enjoyed learning about you through the years, I've talked to different guys that played with you 
and the spiritual impact you had in their life while they were, while they were players and even afterwards and how your relationship with God has been something that transcended football and has carried you throughout, in, throughout your entire life. And uh, when I began to discover what you actually are doing now and uh, it, in a nonprofit context because of the people you're trying to help, I, I wanna just take some time tonight. I want you to explain because some of it's really fa some of it's very fascinating about how it works and how you can actually help people with, mm -hmm. with, with movement, with the brain. And so ATP, Adventures in Training with Purpose, can you kind of just give us an understanding of the organization? I know you work with people with no insurance or money to pay for the service. You are working right now in the inner city uh, with kids in Newcastle, of which 80% of the kids are, your, are at or under the poverty level. You're working with seniors up in the Slippery Rock area, because as we all know with insurance, even if you need therapy and you need help, very often it doesn't go as far as you need it. And so you basically are helping people beyond that. And a, and a little bit later, I'll talk about, ask you about your need with, uh, your work with some of the special needs families and kids, because that's very meaningful to us here as a church. So can you maybe give us some understanding about ATP? I think it's, when I look back, um, how God is, he weaves things together. In Oklahoma, I grew up in Oklahoma, and you may not be aware of this, but in Oklahoma, if you do not become a football player by the time you're in the ninth grade, your parents will put you up for adoption and find a kid that can play. <laughs> and in the ninth grade, I weighed 120 pounds. And, um, and so we were hauling hay and doing those kinds of skills. And uh, when I say hauling hay and those skills, you're on the back of a truck that's, that's bouncing down a hay field. And, and what I began to notice is the... And, and it is, it's changed. But if you look at the Pittsburgh Steelers, the, guy, the guys that were such great athletes, they had such great movement skills. Great movement skills. Not just, uh, not just guys like Lynn Swan, but check out the slowest guy on our, on our offensive line ran a five flat 40. Larry Brown ran a four six. So guys could move. So, uh, what I began to look at as I in, finished playing football was what we're really finding out about how our brain works with movement skills. And uh, one of the, the, the most interesting studies that I read that really put me on this path was um, an article, it wasn't an article, it was a research uh, in one of the journals, and it, and it said this, what makes us move is also what makes us think. And so I think the most simple way you can put it is if I'm, I have kids, we do camps, and they can't skip. I mean, you all probably grew up skipping. They can't skip. And if I'm moving my right arm, that's a left brain function. If I'm moving my left leg, that's a right brain function. Those two parts of my brain have to be tied together. And the brain part that does that is called the corpus callosum. So that's skipping. If I read CAT, C-A-T, depending on if I'm right-handed or left-handed, the one part of my brain says C, actually reads the C, the A, and the T. But the other part of my brain sees a fuzzy little animal, has whiskers, drinks milk, goes meow, has a long tail, scares my wife. <laughs> okay? And so if, we, if the two parts of the brain are connecting, we don't read cat. We read cat. And one of the things that the research constantly shows is we don't need more flashcards. We need more movement skills. So we, uh, you know, I started reading some, some other research for people, there was really an interesting one in uh, Seattle, Washington, and, and they're training kids. I have a 14-year-old that can't even ride a bicycle. Couldn't, but now he can ride a bicycle. Can you imagine being a 14-year-old boy and how many people calling you dork? You know, we, we, you know, bad, we don't like to label people, but that still happens. And so, uh, but this, this lady had, in her after-school program, was teaching children to ride unicycles. And it was unbelievable, unbelievable the difference in their grade point averages. And so we started programs similar to that. We call it Noah's Ark. 
And to give you an, kind of another example is if we have children start off just doing a kangaroo, that's not a problem. If they do a stork on one foot, some of them have a problem. If they do a stork in a tornado, we lose half of them. If they do a frog, they're okay. But if they do a rabbit where the feet move and then the hands move and then the feet, that's a whole different sensory integration sequence. And it, and it creates a problem. So we, we call it Noah's Ark and we just do various movement skills like that. There's a gorilla, there's an inchworm. We get the ark full and then we start, once the children learn that, we start some basic little tumbling skills. And so what, what you were saying to me when, we, when you were explaining this to me is that these movement skills engage parts of the brain exactly. that otherwise are dormant. Exactly. And even, even there's a regenerative, regenerative effect to the brain. And so what you're finding, you're working with stroke victims, uh, you're working with people that have been given up on with certain capacities. And when you learn and train people to do certain movements, and the key isn't necessarily to get them to do them at a, at a, at a high skill level, but it's the movement itself that actually engages the brain. Is exactly. that right? Yeah, and it, it's not just children. It is people that have strokes. One of the things I was taught, maybe some of you were taught, uh, that when we're two years old, our brain is done developing. Well, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and now may the God of peace himself, it's one of those electrical words, sanctify. Because yeah. when I was a kid, you know, I didn't want to get sanctified because it, the, the pastor always shook when you got to get sanctified. I didn't want to get, <laughs> but he says, and now may the God of peace sanctify you and may your spirit <laughs> and your mind, that's like consecrated. Yeah. You got to get consecrated. I didn't want to be consecrated either. <laughs> <laughs> but may, may your may your spirit and your soul, your mind, and your body all be. And you were talking about the word "bless" last week, yeah. which means to be full. This word "teleos" is similar to that, from what I understand, because it means to be all that you can be. And so, so God is telling us, or Paul is writing through the Holy Spirit that all those work together. And so we finally figured it out. There's a, um, a psychologist, Caroline Leaf, and he, she wrote a book, I really recommend it. it if you, it's, it's easy reading, it's great, under, you can really understand it. Who switched off my brain? If you want something a little deeper, Paul Nesbaum. He's the chief of neuropsychology at University of Pittsburgh. And what they talk about is, is a couple properties called neuroplasticity. And it's like how our brain reconfigures itself, okay? And, and we didn't know that it could do that a few years ago. And there's also another property called neurogenesis, which is, it talks about how our brain actually grows new neurons. Um, the one lady, the way she describes it is it's like Nebraska and Pennsylvania. She said, you know, when we think that is occupying mental real estate. And in Nebraska, there's not a lot of trees, so you don't get a lot of synapses there. In Pennsylvania, you're growing a lot of trees, so there's a lot of touching of that mental real estate. I hope that kind of makes sense. No, it does. And that's where, you know, when using, because I know you've gone, you're educated beyond football to do therapy and physical therapy with people and, uh, and have been, you know, trained to actually do that. But you've now moved beyond just the actual function of that to a ministry to serving people that uh, one, that can't afford it, and two, that people have largely sometimes given up on. One of the things that are really meaningful here to us as a church are sp uh, kids with special needs, and, 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 and not just the kids, but the families. And, and we talked a little bit about that and how you had mentioned that when you serve a family with special needs and, and you help increase the opportunities and even uh, the, 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 the capacities of a child, you actually are doing something for an entire family and not just a child. And so what we call it here is that ministry here is called Endless Possibilities. And there are marvelous people who come here who serve in those classrooms and, and some that will, will do a wraparound with a child that, that, uh, and get them, if you will, is, is the terminology mainstreamed into another class. And so we want to serve those families because there's not a lot of that within the body of Christ and church for families with, with kids with special needs. So when you begin to talk to me about how your work was actually giving kids with special needs the opportunity to actually develop 
in areas that otherwise people may have given up on them when you learn to equate movement with the function of the brain. And I think you had told me a story about when you were running the steps and trying to memorize something when you were playing football. Could you connect, maybe tell us that story, but tell us in about maybe a family, a young person that, that this has impacted directly. Right, in fact, I would really, um, let's, let's, let me back up one more step. We have physical disciplines. And so if I wanna get stronger, what do I do? I lift weights. And if I wanna uh, increase um, my endurance, I might run distance. I like running steps, stadium steps. Uh, if I wanna work on balance, I can ride bicycles, unicycles, through slack lines. So I develop those skills. The Bible also, the, it, it, it talks about and gives us spiritual disciplines, you know, prayer. Uh, David talks about um, meditating. You know, I thought that was one of those things I wanted that scared me too, you know, because I thought you had to sit and go mm, or something. But, <laughs> but, but godly meditating is, is considering who God is. And so one of the other dis disciplines, I believe, is... Um, taking the word of God and putting it in your heart. And uh, I had a friend, and we were going to try this. And, uh, and I couldn't memorize anything. And at the same time, I was in grad school at Pitt, and I had to memorize something called the Krebs cycle. I don't know if any of y'all ever had to do this, but I was really struggling. And it's these 32 chemical reaction things. And I was coaching at the time. And uh, I'd go out on the practice field, and, and they would call a play, and in between plays, I was looking down trying to memorize this. And this had gone on for three days, and I wasn't getting it. And so I hadn't even worked out. So I thought, heck with it. Uh, I'll go run. And I put it on a, a five by eight index card, the Krebs cycle, and I went and I did my run up and down Three Rivers Stadium. And when I came back after 40 minutes, I had it memorized. And I'm thinking at the time, how can that be? How come I can sit for three days and I can't memorize this? But I can go run for 40 minutes and I memorized it. And so then I had a friend and he said, uh, let's memorize scripture. I said, where do you want to start? He said, let's start in uh, Romans chapter 8. So I started there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we, st we were running and then you get to chapter two and chapter three. And if whatever, it's the way God connects us. And I just, you know, if you go out and walk, try it. You know, again, that to me goes back to that First Thessalonians 5.23. Put, you know, don't just go out and have a physical time. And you can have a prayer time, but take a, I'd, I like to do a New Testament chapter, then a Old Testament chapter to take a Psalms. And, and while, you know, you don't, you're not looking at it like that. You don't want to run into a car. You just, <laughs> you, just, you just look at it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you put it down and you just go through it in your head. And it is a wonderful way that you can develop a physical discipline and a spiritual discipline. It's the same principle when we work with an athlete, when you work with children that are straight-A students, but God builds that into people that are not very athletic and children that have learning disabilities, uh, emotional problems, um, uh, behavioral problems. We've been able to get this in right now. Uh, we'll have it in three public schools this fall. So I'm in the after school programs. Thank you, praise God. You know, when you, when you, a while back when we talked about this, I realized that when, now I don't run stadium steps, I walk my neighborhood, which is not quite as, I don't know, it doesn't sound as exciting as running the stadium steps at Three Rivers Stadium. I walk <coughs> fastly and briskly through my neighborhood. And so, but what I find is that, I, I told you when I, when I would do that, I would, ideas would come and so I started carrying my phone and I would just talk to my phone and it would, you know, record things for me. And, uh, and, and, and just realizing for all, just for anybody that's here, Anybody watching, if you, if you are dealing with things it, just mentally, or maybe you feel like, man, I'm slowing down in some areas, to equate movement with that. And you, we had talked about uh, a while back about the scripture you had said, in him we live and move and have our being, and movement being that part in the yeah. middle. I think God makes a lot of sandwiches 
in the Bible. Uh, one of them is uh, the Acts 17:28, uh, and uh, I think it's to me it's kind of interesting because I've heard uh, uh, I remember a sermon R.C. Sproul preached on that, and he explained in him we live and explained what life was, and then he kind of left move, and then he explained all this stuff about having our being, and that God is this being that is independent and doesn't. So, but he forgot the inside of the sandwich, or he didn't talk about it, and that's move. In, in him, in Jesus, we live and move. When you, I don't want to bore you, but when someone dies, there's this, there's this substance called ATP, and it makes actinomycin filaments go, and they stop doing that, and they lock up, and the next day it's called rigor mortis. Right. Rigor mortis. We don't move anymore. You can't move. I even think that. So in him, we live, and as long as we're living and having our being, we move in that. Yeah. And, and, and I don't think it's an accident that God puts move in there because there's so much joy in moving. Uh, I've, I've been watching with my wife. I make her watch it. Um, because I have to watch some of her stuff, too. Uh, <laughs> but I've been watching Adventure Sport on Netflix. And these guys, are, they're, they're, they're jumping off mountains and they're parachuting. It's all movement stuff. You know? And nobody's going, oh, man, I don't think, what are we going to do today? Man, they are jacked up to do this. So moving is this great gift that God has given us. And um, so that's what ATP is about, adventures, in training with a purpose. And so before we, there's one area I want to take you to as we close, but before we do that, tell us just a story about, uh, because if you've, if, I know you've worked with families with special needs and you know that how impacting that is to the whole family. And so could, if you could just maybe give us mm -hmm. just a, a snapshot of how this, 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 this oh, has yeah. worked. You, you asked that before. The first one that came on my mind just now is one of the guys we have with um, Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, and Steve can't move his arms at all. Uh, he can move his legs about 10 pounds worth. He can push 10 pounds. So we can put him on a stationary bicycle. Uh, sometimes if I'm not watching, Steve will go boop. It's like, a, you know, and, uh, but what, what we were trying to do is keep whatever movement he has. And the thing that we can, he, but he has his wife, his mother and father, and his uh, cousin. They all help take turns taking care of him. So when you help Steve, you help himself. I mentioned the 14-year-old boy who can now ride a bicycle. He is so proud of himself. There's another little boy that had some learning problems in school. One of the things we're doing with him is we have, you all have seen these mats. We have mats that are colored. There's a red stripe and a blue stripe and a green stripe and a yellow stripe. So, okay, Chris, jump from the red to the blue. Fine. Now, he, got, he has that. Jump from the red to the blue to the green. He's got that. Now, okay, jump from the red to the blue and back to the yellow. And so we give him different sequences. And so he's doing the metal part of it. He has to remember. And then, okay, do that on your right leg. Now do it on your left leg. Now do the first jump on your right and your left. So does that, I hope that makes sense of how those things come together. And his, his mother, you just need to talk to, to the parents. Yeah. She is so excited about how that has made a difference for him in school. Yeah, and so what I wanted people to see beyond, of course, the, 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 the obvious of, of your football career, four, four Super Bowl rings, trying to kill Bradshaw, those kind of things. But I wanted people to actually see how beyond that, how a person can take a passion in their heart and make it make a, a difference for people. You know, as, as, as we were talking further, we were talking about some of the things that people have to process in their life. So as we wind this down, maybe if you could, we had talked about how, how people are stung with regret. And you had some thoughts about that. If you could kind of wind us down, yep. taking us back onto the spiritual side of this, as you processed your life, as we all have to, Talk to us just a little bit about that. Sure. Um, 
Tony Dungy was my roommate when I was coaching. And uh, if, you, if you want to read a really good book, Tony Dungy's book talks about the suicide rate for former NFL players is seven times the national average. They don't all go to Disney World and stay there. And I, I began to see this while I was still playing before they even wrote the book. And I said, OK, I, I don't want this to be the biggest thing that ever happened to me. And I'm going to tell you something. Coming up here was a little more scary than run down on a kickoff uh, to me. Being, OK. So. Not me. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be in the hospital after so that. So the off. regret thing, the regret thing. Um, I don't even like to look at team pictures anymore uh, because of funerals. And one of the people that uh, we don't even really, Elsie Greenwood, I'll never forget at his funeral, the pastor said, Elsie Greenwood, October 12th, 1946, dash. October 23rd, 2012. And then he said, the first date's not important. The second date's import not important. Let me tell you about his dash. And I began to sit there and I was thinking about, okay, what's your dash going to be? And then another funeral that I went to shortly after that happened to be my father-in-law's funeral. And uh, I was, obviously, since I'm part of the family, I was sitting in the front row and this man said, the pastor said, I became a pastor because when I died, I wanted to have no regrets, no guilt, and no shame. And, I, and I've not, there's not been a day since then I haven't thought about it. No regrets, no guilt, and no shame. I'll start with number two. Jesus takes the guilt away. You're going to give people an opportunity in just a minute to have that guilt taken away. No shame. That's number three. I can always do something stupid. You know, Paul talks about finish the fight, can, you know, run the good race, finish the fight, finish the course. The first one, though, no regrets. I think it ties into what you were talking about last week with abundant. And I, I can sometimes imagine I go to shave men in the morning and I'm on the, there on the mirror. Jesus said, wrote down, John, this is your last shave. You ain't going to be here to shave tomorrow. I know where I'm going, but I think about what would I regret? And, and I think we need to ask ourselves, okay, those of you that have held your hands up, that you've stood up for Jesus, okay, you know where you're going, but if this is your last shave, what would you regret? And, and folks, we have time. We don't know how, maybe it's a day, you know, maybe it's a week, but what would you regret? You got to, to me, you got to ask yourself, what would I regret? I would regret if I don't see how far ATP can go. I would regret that. That's fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Guys, would you thank him so much for taking the time to share with us tonight? And, uh, and so as... I want to take a moment now and just give everyone this opportunity as John is gone, going to go be seated. And, and tomorrow, I don't know if I'm going to have time, but I, how he got drafted in the NFL was even a, that was a funny story as well. But time won't let us go there. But again, how many of you enjoyed him today? Wasn't it a blessing? Thank you so much, John. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see myself, you know, yeah, doing any of those things that he talked about, those yeah, how many of you are grateful for people that, that look at doing crazy things as just normal and normal things that are like crazy? How many of you are just grateful that you're one of those normal people and not people that run down a field and get in a car accident every day when they play football? And thank you for doing that for us. How many of you are glad as a Steelers fan, people like that did that for us? It was fun to watch. And hopefully this year we'll have some fun as well. But before we go any further in the service, I want to make sure every person here He's had the opportunity to make a decision, the most important decision you'll ever make in your life, the one that affects your eternity. Would you just bow your heads with me and close your eyes tonight? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I would ask you this question. You know, this life, it comes and it goes very, very quickly. And no matter what you accomplish or don't accomplish or what happens in your life, the reality is this. This life ends. And when this life ends, we have to look to the next life. 
And there's only one way to know beyond a shadow of any doubt that you have what the Bible calls eternal life. And it's by receiving Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior of your life. So if you're here tonight and you've never given your life to Jesus or you're not sure, please don't put your faith in the church. I love church. I'm a pastor. But it won't make you right with God. No church, no sacrament of any church, no denomination, no minister, no one, only Jesus. So if you're not certain that you've ever given your life to the one who died on a cross for your sins and was buried and rose from the dead and paid with his own life the debt that was due me and due you, if you've never given your life to Christ or you're not sure, or perhaps your heart is far from God tonight, maybe you've done that many years ago, but you really aren't walking with God anymore and you want that relationship restored tonight, I want to pray for you right where you're seated. And Jesus will come into your life. He'll make you brand new. Your sin stain will be gone. He will never leave you. He will never, ever forsake you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you'd like to be included in that prayer, I'll pray for you right where you're seated. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just say, Pastor, include me in that prayer. Would you lift your hand right now where you're seated? And I'll pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, one last moment. If you've not yet raised your hand, but you'd like to be included in that prayer, just simply raise your hand and I'll include you as well. Thank you. Hey, listen, if you raised your hand, or you should have, pray this out loud where you hear it with your own ears. Jesus will never leave you. He will never forsake you. We're going to pray it together with you. This is the best decision of your life. Pray this where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you by Jesus Christ. And I open the door of my heart and the door of my life. And I invite you in. I make you the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for coming. I am now your child. My sin is washed away. And I am heaven bound because of a Savior. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Amen. Amen. Give them a hand, would you? Best decision of your life.